entire talk was meant to initially be um, a demo on how to get started with Google Cloud IoT Core, and that's still the um, title on the website, but it's actually going to be a massive introduction to Internet of Things. Uh, then I'll slightly move over to actually introducing the back end for the cloud, for Internet of Things, and then we'll attempt to do the box to web demo I've been trying to do for like three months. Um, so starting off, um, whenever I introduce people to the Internet of Things, I always um, try to show them this landscape. Uh, it's like a very big picture that pretty much summarizes um, all of Internet of Things, essentially. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't do that in Google Slides. It's way too big. It's more than 25 megapixels. Um, but I managed to compress it down, so that's the actual image. It has three layers to it. It has uh, applications, which is all the companies focused on applying Internet of Things. Uh, there's the platforms level where just companies providing platforms. So for example, it, <laughs> payments, analytics, development, security, 3D even. And then lastly is what, what I tend to focus on, which is the building blocks for Internet of Things. It's what you use to actually get the Internet of Things running. Um, you can find the source and more information in the like speaker notes in the slides. So, um, so what is the Internet of Things? Um, the easiest way to find out what the Internet of Things is is to ask Google. So that's what I did. I Google define IoT, and it's the interconnection via the Internet of computing devices embedded in everyday objects, enabling to them to send and receive data. So that's the Oxford Dictionary's definition, and that's what we're going to be dissecting today. Um, so let's start off with everyday objects. Does everyone know what an everyday object is? A fridge. Oh, what, sorry? A fridge. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of them. Um, I've come up with a couple of normal ones, I would think. It's like <laughs> I would see in my everyday life. These are all that some companies have done something with. So security cameras, Nest Cam has indoor outdoor solutions, lights, Philips who have Philips Hue smart lights you can turn on and off via the Google system. So instead of asking it to define IoT, you can ask it to turn your lights on. Um, thermostats, Nest did it again. Alarm clocks, uh, the Amazon Echo Spot is technically an alarm clock. Um, activity trackers, you got Fitbit, Tablet, Wear OS by Google. Uh, doorbells, so many companies do wireless doorbells, it's crazy. Uh, speakers, some people here probably want a Google Home Mini. Does anyone want a Google Home Mini? Person from Oracle left. <laughs> um, and then there's some oddly weird things you could turn to IoT, everyday objects. So everyone has a washing machine, I'd hope. Robot vacuums, refrigerators, kettles, shoes. They're smart shoes to track your steps. Because sometimes uh, watches aren't enough. And then plants, a lot of people like IoT plants want to see if your cactus is growing healthy. Um, so yeah, that's where the first bit of the massive landscape comes in. Uh, there's a lot of personal wear devices. I think Apple Watch, Samsung Gear, home vehicles, uh, enterprise, industrial internet. Uh, enterprise loves them. Uh, a lot of Internet of Things connected desks for hot desking. I'm not sure if this place has Internet of Things connected desks. You can like monitor which desks are used, which desks aren't used. You could like do something to improve usability, like spread out hot desking so like people, yeah, you could do a lot of insights on that, see if a lot of people don't use the desk next to the window, maybe it's because it doesn't have blinds and like you, you can't see stuff on your laptop. Um, so yeah, that's the first bit of Internet of Things, everyday objects. Next up, computing devices embedded in said everyday objects. So these are actually just microcontrollers. Um, so everyone's hopefully seen an Arduino Uno. Has anyone used one in here? Decent amount. Yeah, tons. Um, so yeah, the Arduino Uno has an Atmega328. X is meant to be on the actual chip itself. Um, has a microcontroller, which consists of a couple of things. 
Uh, it has a microprocessor, it has memory, program memory, uh, analog to digital converter, and then the main bit is this oscillator, which oscillates at a frequency which actually drives the microprocessor to actually run your embedded software. Um, they're quite simple to understand. They take input, decode it, and then give you, uh, they take input, do the thing you're asking it to do, and then it gives you output, and then that's usually, input's usually from registers, output is usually into registers. Uh, I think that's first, second year university course, so my uh, loans are well paid off. Um, so yeah, a lot of companies are doing the hardware, that's the building blocks uh, layer of, of the landscape. You got Intel, you got Texas Instruments, which I got examples of, NVIDIA. Um, so you've got plenty of options for microcontrollers. But uh, can you just take a washing machine and slap a microprocessor in it and then you get interim things? Well, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, your washing machine already has microprocessors, microcontrollers in it. That's how it actually does the like timing. It keeps track of how long your wash is supposed to be left in for, controls all of the um, actuators, like the actual spinning wheel. Um, but that's where the third bit comes in, which is computing devices that enable the everyday objects to send and receive data. That's, that's, that's the important bit. Um, so technically, an Arduino, Arduino already has this capability via the USB connector, because if you connect your Arduino via USB to your computer, now your Arduino can send and receive data via the serial, so you can like give it numbers, it can give you back numbers, uh, you can print hello world, that's the most basic example of input output from an Arduino. Um, it also has tons of pins, so up top on the bottom you can, it has 13 digital pins and then a couple of uh, analog pins as well. That lets you connect external sensors, lets you connect tons of stuff. I think you can hook up a screen to it and then just display stuff instead of outputting via serial. Um, a more common example, which is the Raspberry Pi, that has uh, microcontrollers that let it input out the data. For example, yeah, it has the microprocessor on the left, it has the uh, memory on the right. Uh, this is a Model 3B Plus, so brand new, unveiled this year. Um, but then it also has this tiny chip, which is actually the LAN uh, microcontroller, which on the far left you see that Ethernet plug. It lets it communicate to uh, networks via that. It also has a um, wire, so on the other side next to the memory in the far left, has the wireless microcontroller. And then that thing there is actually the like connection to the antenna. And then you see how it goes into the other side pokes out, that's the actual Wi-Fi antenna on your Raspberry Pi, which was pretty cool thing I learned while doing this talk, so not all to waste. But uh, if, if you're, so coming back to the serial example, if, if you're inputting outputting data to your PC from our Arduino, that's not really the Internet of Things, um, that's where the interconnection of these devices comes in. Um, so coming back to that example, uh, Raspberry Pi can connect to any other Raspberry Pi on the network, so it's interconnected. It can, I think, be its own hotspot. So you could like close off, like a closed network of these devices talking to each other. So that's good for think, distributed computing, uh, a good example for that. Um, and then, for example, uh, see a Texas Instruments launch pad that actually has a long range uh, radio and what it, it works kind of like walkie talkies so it, it, it can so that's a massive antenna for it built in you can also attach one there um, you can send data I think it's like a mile radius or something and like any other of these devices can pick it up it broadcasts and then a broadcast gets picked up and you can build your own like addressing stack on it I did that, it was just reinventing the internet. It's not fun. Um, and then there's other examples. So the Philips Hue lights actually use a protocol called Zigbee. It's kind of like Bluetooth. It's, it forms not a local area network, not a wide area network. It creates a personal area network. 
which is exactly what Bluetooth does. So for example, my watch is talking to my um, phone, uh, and if I had my Bluetooth earphones on, that would create my personal area network. These make the same kind of network, where there's a gateway, and then all the Hue lights have this tiny um, radio that connects them together so they can communicate. <coughs> And there's way more different um, stacks you can use. So Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, NFC is one of them. You can really, if something's close enough to be connected by NFC, you'd probably be able to connect it physically. Um, but so personal area network, uh, closed off Raspberry Pi network doesn't really fit the bill of the Internet of Things, which is where the last bit comes in. And I'm not defining the internet in, in, in this talk, fortunately. But it's kind of like all the previous definitions, but on a global scale. So how you can achieve that is coming back to the connectivity thing. A lot of these networks won't make IoT on their own. So Bluetooth, Zigbee, a lot of them need gateways to actually connect to internet proper. So the way Philips does it is all of their lights have Zigbee, which connects to their gateway, which has Zigbee and Wi-Fi, I think. I don't actually own Philips Hue, so I'm not sure how it connects. Probably Ethernet, maybe? Yeah, Ethernet, getting off from Jules, he knows. Um, so yeah, that's the concept of like man in the middle gateway that connects one closed network to the internet, and hence you get the internet of things, and then you get an internet of light bulbs. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the Internet of Things defined in 10 minutes. Um, going on to some examples I found on how to actually do them yourself. I found this funny article about how you can make an Internet of Things logger with an Arduino Uno without any like shields. And a lot of shields connect and give the uh, Arduino like Wi-Fi or LoRaWAN or like some other form of uh, communication. But all they claim to, to use is an Arduino, you know, a USB cable and a laptop. So that's what it looks like. Because um, the laptop itself is acting like a man in the middle to connect the Arduino to the Wi-Fi. And it's a, a, a bit like, yeah, it works. It connects the Arduino to the internet. You can transmit temperature and stuff over it, but it's not really compact, I'd say. You wouldn't really be able to put this in the field and capture environmental data. Uh, but it's a great way of proving a concept, though. So it's quite quick, pretty easy for newcomers to get a hang of. I think they set up a Python worker that just listens to the Arduino, spits data over Wi-Fi. Um, an easier way, which is what most people start off with, is a Raspberry Pi logger. So the Raspberry Pi already has Wi-Fi. It already has some sensors on it, so you can just use it. Uh, but the problem is, because it runs Linux, some people find that as a barrier to like program it. it might be a bit difficult. Um, so for example, someone has a temp, uh, screen on it, temp transmitting a temperature uh, and then barometer data, and all it needs is power. But you could connect it to a battery pack, and then you just have like a compact-ish Wi-Fi Internet of Things device. Most people um, in industry, to prove a concept, use like espressive boards. So the ESP8266 is, is a quite a small Wi-Fi board. Uh, you can power it by battery, you program it using a PC, and then it is quite small. So like, I think um, that's the actual ESP module, and then it has some power management stuff, and uh, and a temperature sensor, and then you can power that um, by a battery. And then since it's that's on a prototype board, so it's soldered as well, but you can do it by jumper pins, they do development boards. You can also see the antenna here. Um, and then like the most difficult way to do it, but it's usually what industry goes for, is to design your own custom hardware. That's what I'm unfortunately doing for my dissertation for uni. So that's just a clone on what I'm about to show you, but it'll be way more compact. It has the bits I need, all the power management. Um, so here's a comparison of how these um, 
for when he's analyzed uh, compared to each other on how easy it is, how compact, cheap, and efficient. Uh, and cheap is at a mass production scale. So the laptop Arduino logger would cost quite a lot to mass produce because you need to buy a laptop for every device you have. Um, the Raspberry Pi uh, is cheaper in bulk to buy. I think they're like, normally they're 35 pound, but if you buy them more, maybe there's a discount. Pound bought tens of thousands of pies before. Uh, the e espressive module, uh, it's quite small, it's quite cheap, has the things you need and then custom has literally everything you need and nothing more so you're not wasting any more money and then if you buy in bulk from uh, manufacturers then you get a big discount. So cool, that, that's, that's the hardware side of things covered, that's how you connect a everyday object to the internet but the problem you can face if you're like running your own uh, hosted server and not using serverless, that's been a topic today for some reason, um, is if you have like 10,000 devices talking to a single server, that server will tend to fall over, which is not ideal when you're trying to capture like sensitive-ish data. So if you're capturing health data, patients, like heart rate, ECG, something, and you lose a bunch of data because your server fell over, that's, that's not ideal. Um, so I, I love this tweet. I, I found this tweet like a, 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 a year ago. It says, how many servers could it take to turn on a light bulb? And then Philip says, hold my beer. And that's how the Philips, the entire like cloud stack looks like. And I think there's a, yeah, there you go. That's the actual uh, slide from Google Cloud Next that's some, from some years ago. Um, so that's what goes on when you either ask Google to turn your light bulb on or like you do it through their app. There's a lot of different interfaces. Um, we can try to pick it apart. So on the hardware <coughs> level, it's down there. You have lights, which are your like light bulbs. Um, they're plugged into the light bulb thing. Not really technical, don't know the name for it. Uh, those, because they have power, they don't really need batteries or anything. They talk to the bridge via Zigbee. Uh, so the bridge is usually within a household, so it's like shouldn't be too difficult to connect to. Um, and the bridge is the central gateway that now can talk to you. Um, there are two things. There are two Kubernetes clusters um, running, doing something. I've tried looking uh, Freddie Mercury up the name for one of their clusters, and I just got results for Freddie Mercury. So that wasn't really helpful. Tried adding Philips so you can find much, so maybe it's like internal proprietary stack. But what it's most likely doing is it's, it's uh, asking for configs. So the bridge manages the lights, and it's probably asking, uh, it probably has its own like key it can access uh, the API through, and then it can see what setting should my light bulb be on. Maybe there's some fancy push notifications going on, so. The, the, the server tells the bridge, turn this light on, then it turns the light on, which is pretty good. There's a health suite device cloud, which is Philips's proprietary uh, internal monitoring solution, which I think just reports how healthy the devices are. Maybe like the bulb doesn't turn on anymore. Uh, it offers it as a service to other uh, home manufacturers. So I think you could like plug your washing machine to their health suite cloud and just monitor how your devices are used, that sort of thing. Um, then it lets third-party clients connect to their cloud. This is all hosted in Google Cloud Platform, by the way, so I think that's why it was in Google Cloud Next, just to show off their architecture. Um, so if you have an Android app uh, through their API, you can control your own light bulbs. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you have the rest of the stuff, which is the center is the databases. <coughs> so they use big data and BigQuery because they have massive amounts of data coming in. Um, they have Elasticsearch, which lets them search. BigQuery lets you, as demonstrated before, I think like 17 tri uh, billion records took like 13 seconds to do and you only paid for the single query. Uh, you don't need to worry about computing time. Then they have some internal monitoring systems. Stackdriver is the Google Cloud Platform logging, debugging issues. 
So if it, like your app crashes, then on your Android app, if, if your Kubernetes cluster suddenly crashes, it will get reported to Stack Driver. If you have on call set up, it will like notify the person on call. So they're aware of it instantly. They can come in, do some nice things, and then hopefully resolve your issues so you can turn on your light bulbs. Um, Twilio is for messaging, so I think it can like text you, getting a text from your light bulb. Maybe your light bulb calls you. <laughs> Internet things. Um, so there are a couple of approaches. So as, as a couple of approaches to making hardware, there's a couple of approaches to cloud. Uh, so you can build your own cloud, you can purchase and install physical servers, you wait for them to like ship in from eBay. Uh, you have to network and firewall all of them together so like people can't access your internal stuff. You install all of your applications, all of your APIs, all of your message brokers, databases, and then lastly you hope everything just works. Um, it, it is quite scalable if, if you've got the time and effort. Uh, so yeah, I've had a quick cursory look through what our server options are on eBay. So you get you could get like a pretty nice dual core Xeon machine for 150 quid and like has 24 gigs DDR then like 1.2 terabyte storage. It's pretty good value. Um, you can use someone else's cloud. So there when I got into cloud uh, <laughs> I rented virtual or physical servers, so you have either DPSs or you have uh, bare metal servers you can just rent and it's essentially owning your own server, except you can just cancel the subscription. They do all the restarts, all of the power management, networking, firewalling. Uh, so yeah, you pay someone to sort all of that out. It's quite good if you can like run Dockerize applications, so like you Dockerize your API and then you just run it. Uh, containers are the future, as someone said. Um, so yeah, you got, uh, I think, OVH. Uh, they run services like Kim Sufi, I think, and um, so you start. So you can rent some decent servers. You can rent infrastructure and then build it up yourself. DigitalOcean is another good example. I personally love it for like quick and small projects. So you can like spin up a droplet. The cheapest one is five dollars a month, which is a bargain. It does. It has pretty good like connectivity. I think it has like gigabit uplink for the first couple of um, for like a limited set of bandwidth you can use. So you can like sudo up, upgrade to update all of your packages really quick. Um, and then you can obviously scale up vertically. Uh, they also have load balancing now, so you can scale up horizontally as well as vertically. So that gives you good scalability options. Then you can lastly use a cloud platform, so that is serverless. You use someone else's um, servers as a service, so you don't have to worry about actually spinning any servers up, any virtual machines, anything. Um, so yeah, Google Cloud Platform has message brokers as a service, databases as a service, cloud functions as a service, and then lastly, APIs as a uh, service, so that, that is Google Core uh, Google Cloud IoT Core, um, and yeah, so this is infinitely scalable, uh, performance-wise as well as cost-wise. So I think at Google Cloud Next, one of the takeaways I got was, uh, if, if you're getting an infinitely scalable um, service, you better be able to infinitely scale your wallet, because <laughs> it can get really expensive if you're not careful. So yeah, a lot of cloud providers, so Google Cloud Platform, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure. I didn't know I um, sales sat did cloud platform, I think. Um, IBM Watson's one of them. And looking through them, I found that a lot of them have very similar services. It's just you kind of choose who you're with. Um, essentially, some of them make it really easy to migrate um, your services to another platform, some of them don't, so be careful with that. So yeah, there's um, one example of how easy it is to set up versus how cheap it is. Um, so yeah, if you own it, it's quite cheap uh, to run, but it's not very easy to set up. Posted is like the middle ground and the managed is quite easy, quite cheap, or not, depends. And be careful of, um, reinventing standards, so some XKCD, so 
basically says you can develop your own standards, so you can develop your own IoT standards, so you can run some cloud functions to gather device data, you can push configs out, but then you're essentially competing against another service that does pretty much the same. Um, so yeah, starting off with Google Cloud Platform, that's what I'm going to be focusing on, especially IoT Core. So you probably know GCP is just a suite of cloud computing services. It's obviously offered by Google. Uh, runs on the same infrastructure as Google, so like YouTube, Google Plus. Uh, there's a nice description of all of its services, and then all of them have a lot of free tiers. So there's Compute Engine, you can rent VMs. I uh, think you can get a micro instance and a 30 gig HDD for free for a month. Uh, Kubernetes is one of them. Yeah. And a lot of other services. So you could technically do hosted uh, cloud on Google Cloud Platform, even though they have a lot of serverless features. Um, so yeah, IoT Core. Where it steps in is where devices can connect to each other via Wi-Fi or LoRa. Uh, Google Cloud IoT Core just emulates an edge device you can interconnect to. Um, so it, pro it lets you do that via HTTP APIs and MQTT APIs. So instead of connecting to another Raspberry Pi on your network, you would just connect to a device on the IoT Core. So if you just address it by an IP and you can just push data to it, and that effectively creates a gateway into Google Cloud Platform. So from then, you can do a lot of fancy stuff. So this is the sample architecture it gives you. Um, you yeah, have devices maybe going through IoT Edge, which is another thing, another topic for a talk. But they, uh, it goes into your IoT core, and then once your data is in there, you can you have free access to it. You can. Um, well, usually you put it, it on a message queue, so Google Cloud pops up as a measure, message broker as a service, um, and then through data flow, flow you can put your data in uh, either Cloud Span or a big table. Then once you have tons of data, you can run big queries on it, uh, and you can like do machine learning on your data, you can visualize your data, uh, do stuff with data so you, so you and that's how you get your golden insights once you have a lot of devices pushing data in. Um, you can start to see what that data actually means, how it's valuable. Um, and then you can push configurations back to the device through uh, either cloud functions or data flow again. And that uh, basically you can like update your device to transmit every five minutes instead of like 10 sort of thing. Um, so that's a comprehensive look. And then the, the, the box to web demo. So what I got with me is uh, one of these Texas Instruments uh, boards. So you need to be careful with this one because I actually broke it. Um, socks on a carpet with an electrostatic sensitive board. Not a great idea. So pop, pop quiz. Um, looking at this board, which, which part of it do you think is responsible for um, the actual processing? Is it A, B, or C? Show of hands, who's for A? Show of hands, who's for B? Show of hands, who's for C? <clears throat> so C is the debugger. Uh, that lets you connect your device to computer. And C is the thing that actually programs the device. A is the main microcontroller, which does all of your computation. So the schematic I showed before is actually ripping everything except the microcontroller out because I don't need the debugger because I can use this as the programmer for my board so it should be arriving at some point. And B is just the power management. Oh no, live, live, live demo time. Uh, we have some time. I'll try to make it quite simple. Uh, let's see if I can switch to, there you go. Um, cool. Um, so when you buy one of these, you get it in a nice box, you get it in a nice electrostatic bag. This one actually works. Um, take it out, hopefully you're not wearing socks on a carpet, and then you, you see this page. I can probably zoom it in. It's quite a, quite some, quite a nice uh, getting started guide. Um, 
So to set up your device, uh, you have to install uh, Mongoose OS, which is one of the real-time operating systems offered for these devices. Uh, so now Arduino does one of them. Uh, this one has Mongoose OS. It can also run Energia, which is Texas Instruments one. But it has a weird issue where it only saves your programs to memory. So if you restart it, your program wipes, which isn't useful. So I'm using Mongoose OS uh, to install uh, Mongoose OS, you literally copy paste these commands into your terminal and you hopefully enter your correct password first time. Hey, that was good and correct. Uh, it installs Mongoose OS and then it should hopefully run it whenever it finishes downloading. And the Mongoose OS tool is what you use to actually build all of your applications and then flash them on your device. And flashing is essentially programming it. Hey, it actually opened this time. So what I'm going to do is, because I, I was lazy and didn't set up um, proper permissions, I need to run Mongoose OS as sudo, so it actually has access to my serial ports. Um, so if I plug this port in, just by a micro USB into my laptop, it has some shiny lights on it, there's the camera picking that up. Uh, hopefully it doesn't fall off the desk. Uh, you just choose a port you want to use, and then my board is the CC3220, uh, so that's me set up. Uh, what you do next is you follow the quick start guide and flash the demo firmware, uh, which is, let's find the code snippets. It's amazing running Linux, because uh, you can just like copy paste code into your terminal, which is not what you're meant to do. You're meant to look over them before pasting. Uh, I got the drivers, create new app, you need to, oh, you actually need to type it in, that's annoying, let's do a split view. Um, so I am cloning https github.com mongoose os apps demo js and that, I'm copying that into app1, so I'll just make a folder. Uh, then it goes automatically goes into my app. That's cool. Um, so let's build the app. Just type Mongoose OS build, and then it uses its own cloud to actually build it for you. So what could show you what the um, demo firmware actually contains is just a JavaScript file uh, with some sample code in it. And what it does is it packages that all up, that all up locally, sends it off to its own cloud builds that into firmware files and then downloads it back to your PC. Uh, so that's the easiest way of doing it. If you don't trust their cloud, you can uh, also download the builder as a Docker image. So you can just run a local Docker image and build the application locally. So I'm kind of relying on, on Thames Valley Science Park's Wi-Fi a bit too much with this. Hopefully it goes through and um, spits a nice firmware file for me. It's connected to my uh, device on the right, so it's just doing stuff. Cool, so command completed, that means our firmware has been built. Let's Mongoose OS flash to, so this will actually use the big debugger to just start like literally flashing both the lights and the microcontroller with the new firmware. So hopefully that goes through. If it doesn't, then my demo is quite um, bad. So it connects to the bootloader, it connects to the actual debugger, uh, does some stuff, and then exit status one, fail to, oh no, it's that error. I've had that before. I'm not sure I'm using the board that actually works. Maybe this one worked all the time. Uh, let's flash this one. Because I broke one of the boards, so like the debugger can't actually find the microcontroller, so it like that can't find anything to flash. This one gives me a different error. Um, try turning it off and on again. Uh, it's weird. Someone said something about live demos, and I didn't believe them. And the file. Well. That's them. That that's that demo cut short. Um, maybe I actually broke this one while I was like messing around with it on carpet. 
Let's give it one final go before moving on to the actual cloud bit. Uh, so it's connecting to the bootloader and it <coughs> runs out of the file. Um, so if it did work, um, you would just go into your cloud project, you would go into IoT course, so that's all of your services on the left that Google offers. Um, and what you essentially do is you create a device registry that's uh, like an entity in Google Cloud that you assign your devices to. And then you would name it something sensible, like why does my demo not work? And then you select a region where you want your devices to like connect to easier. So if you're in Europe, like we are, then you do that. Uh, you can create a topic to publish to. So the, the topics in MQTT is just on a message broker is a device publishes on it. It stays there until someone consumes it or like it sends it off to everyone, depends how you set it up. Um, so let's make a, there was meant to be a heartbeat topic. Uh, the, the device just publishes to you and then it just shows up and I'm like, hey, the device works. But since the device doesn't work, uh, then we won't really get that. Uh, so you, once you make your registry, uh, I'm pretty sure I just canceled making the registry. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, boom. Europe. Since I just made the um, thing. Great. Cool. So now we got a registry. Uh, if the device worked, you could add the device. Because what you basically do is you, you add its public key to the registry. And um, since the device uh, in the firmware it has a private key, it can encrypt all the messages and then send those off. Um, and then you receive them and you can figure out Jules is messaging the group chat. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, if we switch back to the slides after that demo failed, cool. Uh, so there are other approaches you can take in, um, in the hardware bit. You can either simulate a device. So all of you got Quick Lab tokens. There's actually a Quick Lab that teaches you Google IoT Core and it does it in a more stable way because uh, uh, it runs on your PC, it doesn't rely on hardware that can break, or you can use a physical device. So what I did with it is I, my dissertation is all about monitoring wine cellars. So I'm just slapping two things into wine cellar. Um, and that's my, the current state of it, it's just logging all the data. So you got humidity, temperature. Uh, there's another board that I was going to examine, it got recently announced. It's a pretty good star board if you want, it's in the slides. So yeah, thank, thanks for um, listening. Um, q and A's I'll be available after this. Um, hope it taught you what the Internet of Things is. Thank you.